somewhere. You gotta you gotta tweet that when the season's over. Come on. <laughs> I think there might be a deleted scene of it. Actually, isn't there? <sighs> I can't remember. I think there might be. I think there might be. And and it, and it's oh, it's it's epic. It's really epic. And he says. You know, um, but it was it was cool because he kind of stood up for us and he's like, you you threatened the producers of this fine program. And um, and uh, he cuts this promo. It's epic. And then um, and then once we had once conversations between us and Eddie resurfaced um, because we had this conduit, we had our friends do and we 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 kind of he was our mediator, I guess you could say, in order to get him back on board for this episode um you know the jim Cornette promo or the threat of the jim Cornette promo was a somewhat of a factor i think in 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 eddie wanting to participate thinking that okay well there's this epic promo that's going to be cut you know i better i better fire back and so he did and he he has a whole promo he cut about jim Cornette. um and so then there were early cuts of this episode that were basically just like all four of these guys just fucking cutting promos on each other, you know, like nonstop, you know, like you have John Stossel saying, fuck you, David, which is amazing. And then you have, you know, David talking about Eddie and then Jim talking about Eddie and then Eddie talking about Jim and Eddie talking about David talking about Stossel, you know, and it was just like this crossfire thing that was like, you know, interesting. But then again, it's like how much, you know, you got to tell the story too. And again, because Jim is kind of in that narrator position in this, or more in the historical voice in this position, it, it kind of felt weird for someone who's not really involved in the story just to start cutting promos on <laughs> people who are part of the show. But it is entertaining. But so, so then, yeah, once we got to Houston, and once we kind of, you know, once you know the situation cooled down, like you know, he he was he was cool, you know, and his. Um, you know, and 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 doing the interview with him was fine. And um, he also brought um, he brought the grappler uh, with him as well, Len Denton. Right? He brought the grappler with him and was like, "You guys should interview the grappler." And I was just like, "Whoa! I didn't know I was going to be interviewing the grappler today." <laughs> you know, and it was kind of like kind of being blindsided with this with this whole thing. And and it's and I, I felt bad because it's like you know he's not really part of this story and you know i don't want to waste his time and everything so it was a little bit of a of a crazy day but you know his his interview as far as a in as, as far as an engaging passionate interview goes i mean you know i i was very happy with it i was very happy with his interview um and once the, that was all said and done uh, it was good but then like you know after when we wrapped production you know um there was just kind of between David and between Eddie, there was just a lot of uncertainty about how, what this piece was going to be like. And so I think that they kind of both of them and respectfully were just kind of getting anxious about it. And, um, you know, it takes time to edit these things and, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And, uh, I think that, you know, we, I just had to field kind of a lot of quelling of anxieties, um, for several months, all the way up until last night and probably now and through until today, um, just in terms of the whole thing. Um, because again, like I was saying, this story has so much to do with, you know, the, the media and, uh, the distrust of, you know, their, how their careers have been portrayed. And I don't know how David feels about the episode. And I, and I, and I hope that David likes it. Um, you know, I hope that he likes it. I haven't heard from him yet, but I, I, I hope that he, I hope that he dug it. Well, he's probably coming to look for you. You know, the, the footage we saw <laughs> of him as a bounty hunter, yeah. uh, especially the stuff that, uh, you guys teased on Twitter that felt like it was from a Japanese home video or something like that. It was just tremendous. Uh, I, I, how how much fun was it, Jason, to explore the the sort of uh, bounty hunter version of Doctor D's persona? That was a really cool aspect of his life that I didn't really know too much about, other than just seeing the odd clip that I could find on YouTube. But then when we went through a storage locker, he just had so many more tapes of, from his bounty hunting days. Um, but that, to me, in some ways, was just oh, man. It was like almost even more fascinating, if you could say, than the wrestling stuff. Um, because he has so many intense bounty hunting stories. And he told us a few of them. And, you know, it would have been great. Like, we could do a whole episode just about his bounty bounty hunting exploits. But we highlighted one of them. 
that is like a story he gets into even more detail in, in his book. Um, but that bounty hunting uh, story of how he like tracked down this guy who had like kidnapped two young girls and had them in captivity for like, I think it was over two years and the FBI tried to take this guy down and rescue them, but they couldn't find him. And so they got Dr. D on it and he was able to track them down. And the fir his first, we didn't put this in the episode, but it, the, the first time he found the guy, he just told the FBI as to where this guy's whereabouts were. And the FBI like screwed it up and the, this guy got wind uh, that they were on his tail. And so they took off. I, th I believe they took off. Yeah, it was down to Puerto Rico. And so then David decided he would go down there himself. And he tracked the guy down, found him in a bar and, you know, took him, took him in and took these two girls in. And they had like a baby and two, like, I think like, like guard dogs with them as well, too. And he's he, a crazy scene. Yeah. yeah. Like he talked about how like he brought them back. Uh, to where the girls were from, and he hand delivered the two girls to uh, <laughs> their parents. And uh, to this day, he still keeps in touch with them. And um, but it was just a remarkable, like crazy story. Like yeah, just, fearless. He's so yeah, fearless. So fearless. Like, like yeah, like when you hear about him being like bounty hunting, like in the Bronx in the like mid '80s. You know, just like being there by himself at like 2 a.m. is um, just yeah, so intense. Like, but. Uh, you know, I can't imagine being somebody opening their door and seeing <laughs> David Schultz standing there looking for you. Like maybe of all the subjects we interviewed, he'd probably be the one I'd be least surprised if I heard a knock on my door and I opened it and I saw David. <laughs> yes, that's why I'm. That's why I won't be sleeping tonight either. Yeah. Or the next couple of weeks, but um, I I have to just point out that I just love that that, that one clip. Of the guy uh, in the whole bounty hunter section of the episode where that one guy's like, he must be like snorting speed. And he's like, oh, that's the one that beat the shit out of Geraldo Rivera. Yeah. You know, <laughs> whatever you know, what he's talking about. Yeah, he's like a fan of Dr. D. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel good going there with you. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's tremendous. You know, one of the things that did jump out is in wrestling, it's almost one of those deals where no matter what, you never talk about money. And... John Stossel just comes out with it. Yeah, I was hurting, and then I got two hundred eighty thousand dollars, and I started to feel a little better. Yeah, and the the gerosomatic illness, sure, um, is 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 an interesting thing because I think he, you know, his he 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 comes off, you know, very heelish, you know, in that in that section, but he. Um, he was explaining in his interview that he actually believes that that is an actual phenomenon. Um, I'm just explaining how he feels about it. Yeah, he's done a piece about it, too. Yeah, where he, he actually feels like, you know, he was holding on to his anger and holding on to his pain um, over this thing. And, 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 and when that doctor told him that you have a gerosomatic illness, you know, he, he, was, he was basically like, you know, fuck you. You know, but then, like, when he – but he said when he did get paid – um, you know, then, then it started to actually let it go and his pain finally <laughs> subsided. And, you know, he, he, he believes that as like a, as like a scientific phenomenon. That's sure. what he was explaining to me, to, to us. No, I get it. It's just hysterical to me because it's almost like, you know, I'm going to spike the ball on you, but then later he's like, oh shit, maybe there's something to it. But the number 280 really <laughs> jumped out because we, we never hear things like that. And then you guys, of course, examined other similarities, uh, you know, with the whole Richard Belzer incident. I mean, I was low key expecting you to bring up the whole Vader thing, but that probably would have been way too difficult to explain. But over the years, yeah. a lot of guys have sort of jumped to the defense. And I thought maybe the line of the episode, besides the go home line, is from Jim Cornette, where he says, Man, Hulk Hogan could have shot Richard Belzer in the head and he wasn't getting fired. Uh, just, <laughs> just tremendous. So um, good. When you guys are, are sort of putting this story together, I'm sure you felt like, Hey, we need to sort of stitch this stuff together and show that this wasn't a one-off thing. Other stuff like this happened. And then eventually we realized maybe it was all for naught because to avoid some taxes, Vince sort of did the same thing. And man, you want to talk about silly seeing the undertaker in full quote unquote gimmick standing next <laughs> to the governor of New Jersey. My gosh, that stands out. Does it not? 
I know. I, I want that action figure play set of like the yeah. uh, Undertaker at the at like the New Jersey uh, State Athletic Commission sure. play set. <laughs> um, no, yeah, yeah. Um, and oh, there's, man. Been, there's been like more clips that I didn't even know about that have come out since we started teasing this episode. There was a couple others. Yeah, like I had. Oh yeah, the the one of Buddy uh, of uh, the uh, Buddy Roberts man. figure four. Yeah, ha- have you seen that one before, Conrad? I, I before? have. He really applies the figure four like. Yeah, for real. that was almost more scary than the slap. I thought it is scary. Yeah, yeah. He's like, come on, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it's just like being in the grips of a wrestler like that, and you're screaming like, "No!" And there's nothing you can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, we had a lot of fun like the other day on social media, just, you know, kind of sharing all the great moments of, you know, wrestler on journalist uh, violence. And um, it's interesting just like, and also, you know, Cornette explains that the whole move that Hogan had on Belzer was kind of this old trick, you know, that they would do to like skeptics, you know, that that was something that they would do. And you even see it. And there, there's also another one. I don't know who the TV host is, but one of the, one of the fabs, uh, puts on uh, puts on a puts on a headlock or a sleeper on on some other TV host that is skeptical about wrestling, um, and so it was it was fun to kind of share the greatest hits of that uh, the other day on social media. But the Belzer one is 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 very on topic because um, you know because it happened so soon after the Stossel one. And it involves Hogan, who's part of this story in, in some ways. And um, yeah, and and then that's that's way more violent. I mean, you know, the, he cracked his head open. And and actually, if you go on YouTube and you just search for it, you search for the Hogan Belzer thing, you'll see like a segment with him talking about it, um, like after the fact. Like he like uh, he like plays the clip back, and then he actually turns around and like shows you like the stitches like in his head from like where his head busted open. And like it's pretty crazy, you know. It's pretty pretty crazy. I mean, it's hard to imagine this stuff happening uh, just in what we know now, and lawsuits and everything, and just how the industry has changed. This episode really sticks out in a way of like, man, the industry has changed, hasn't yes. it? Yes. Oh my gosh, I'm glad you said that. And we we we, sh- we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about Hulk Hogan because I got to tell you, one of my my favorite things of this episode is Doctor D wanting to feel like. You know, he properly conveys to the audience, Hey, Hulk Hogan is nothing special. When I met him, he didn't have nothing. He was living in his van. He used to sleep at my house. You can tell it's coming from a bitter place of, Hey, I felt like this guy was my friend. And he even examined that in the story where he admits, yeah, he was probably one of the better friends I ever had until mm-hmm. he turned his back on me. But when he did, it's like Dr. D just switched it off, man. And I love when you guys are in his storage facility and he's flipping through pictures And I think we hear Jason say, Hey, what's on the back of that photo? And he turns it around and old friend forgot his name. Just fucking (laughs) remarkable because you know, it's done with a wink and a smile, but there is some real bitterness in Dr. D towards his old pal, Terry, about how all of this came together. And Jason, I think maybe you were the person who zeroed in on that first, at least from what we saw on camera. What can Mm -hmm. you tell us about the Hogan relationship, Jason? Well, it was very apparent, like right off the top. Like I said, when we first landed at his place, the first thing we did was set up the cameras and we started filming in that storage locker. And so, yeah, he started going through those photos. And every time like Hogan would come up, he would just like start ribbing him. And it was like the whole time (laughs) we were there, if he came up, you just like, but it was like, it was kind of like, it wasn't done in any kind of like, I don't know. There wasn't like. I didn't feel any like real malice. Yeah. Malice or venom. I could sense that. Like I bet these guys could get together and patch things up, you know, that they were old buddies and I bet they're, I don't know, maybe that could like happen again or some, I don't know, but I just got a sense. It was just like, he just kept ribbing him. Like you would rib like an old friend kind of, I don't know that you had like some problems with, uh, but I don't know. It was really, it was really interesting. Like that energy was there and it was very palpable, but um, it was just, I don't know. It was, it was, it was funny. It was, there was something charming about it. Evan, you've always been, uh, sort of shoot for the moon. And if you miss, you know, whatever, maybe you land amongst the stars is Hogan. One of the stars you're aiming for, for this show, because it feels like, uh, he would have been uh, a, a suitable person to talk to about all of this. 
Oh, man. I, yeah, would love to have had Hogan's perspective on this whole story. I mean, you know, obviously we include. 